Welcome to the Decoding Innovation podcast series, brought to you by the EY Nottingham Spurk Innovation Hub, where we explore the innovative technologies, business models, and ideas that are shaping the future of industries. During each episode, we meet with stakeholders at the cutting edge to discuss innovations in their space, challenges they need to overcome, and their outlook on the future. Hello and welcome. I'm your host, Mithali Sharma. Our guest is Bob Nordelli. Currently, Bob leads Accelerate, a company he founded, where he gives investment and advisory help to Fortune 500 and public and private clients. Bob, you talked a lot about culture and specifically at the heart of it, the people, how you bring them in the fold, how you develop a relationship with them. But let's talk about selecting the right person for the right job, because running a multi-billion dollar company, sometimes you have to make those decisions pretty quickly. How do you figure that out? Uh, that's probably one of the most challenging questions that a, a, a chairman, a CEO, uh, president has to make. One of the things I would, I would uh, offer here, let's make sure before we run to the posting board that we really need that job. That's number one. Is this a meaningful, high value return position that we want to fill? Okay. So, so you, I, I don't want to assume that everybody approaches it that way. We got to make sure that every job uh, that we add or every position we fill is critical to the future of the business with the right person, number one. Number two, let's make sure that we're looking internal. And I think one of the most positive things that I've learned over this 50 plus years is the ability to cite talent one or two levels below your direct reports and reach down and elevate it, he or she, is the most powerful thing you could do for that person and for the organization. It sends a rocket ship of message out there that people can get promoted from within. They don't have to wait for their turn by working hard, by delivering, by demonstrating the four E's I'll talk about, that they would be recognized and we would elevate them you know, maybe one or two levels in the organization because of their performance. Well, what, what does that mean of their performance? First of all, whether internal or external, right? You, you have, you, you're looking for somebody with high energy, high energy. They don't measure themselves in time. They measure themselves in accomplishment, right? I was in a meeting one day and I said, we got to get this done. And, and back then everybody was pulling out their planners, mm -hmm. looking at their calendar. I said, hey, you guys are looking at your calendar. I'm looking at my watch. I mean, we got to get this done now, right? So I look for energy and then the ability to energize an organization. The third E is entrepreneurial. A childlike curiosity about everything that they do. Always asking questions, always trying to understand the fundamentals. How do we plus this? How do we make it better? How do we move faster? How do we make sure that we have market focus and we're customer centric? And the final E, of course, is it wraps it all up, is execution. Are we delivering on the pro forma? Are we delivering on the acquisition? Are we delivering on the technology? Is it basically delivering on what we agreed the fundamentals would, would be involved in the capital allocation, the crewing that we would bring together to implement this, this product or project or what have you? So I think it's, I think it's those. Now, if you go outside, you don't have the same luxury of having seen individuals within your organization over a period of time demonstrate those four qualities. So how do you do it on the outside? Well, certainly you mentioned, you know, I would interview that candidate if it was a direct report. Many times I also wanted to interview the next level down, one, one a direct report to my direct reports. And then it's critically important, critically important that your chief human resource officer has his or her thumb on the pulse of what's critical relative to that individual to match up with what we're trying to accomplish in the business. Because nothing is more distractive than bring, either promoting somebody from within or bringing somebody in from the outside that doesn't work out, right? Mm -hmm. And here's the other important thing, is you gotta make sure you pack, pass the snicker test, not the candy bar, mm. but 
the organization knows if you made a bad decision. The worst thing you can do, the worst thing you can do is two things. Not face into the fact you made a bad decision, right? Or demote up, demote up. He or she's not cutting it. So we'll put them in this job where they can't do harm. And the organization says, wow, he or she got demoted up. And, and, and a lot of times people would come and say, Bob, look, I'll pick up whatever he or she were doing. Let's save money. Let's just get rid of that position. I've got capacity. You know, I've only got a dozen direct reports. I could do one more. I just won't meddle as much, right? Because if you're at one over two, we always look at layers in an organization. But yeah. And, and here, here's again a little the way we look. If you go outside and it's freezing cold and you got 10 sweaters on, you're not cold. Mm -hmm. As you start taking the layers out of an organization or the sweaters off, you realize what the real temperature is out there. So make sure that you always are looking at layers, spans of control, because bureaucracy sneaks in there and you start getting one over two, one over one. It's crazy, right? So make sure that the person has the ability for a broader span of control to reduce layers. Interesting um, that you said you would actually try to interview people maybe a couple of layers below you. So you had your finger on the pulse. That seems to be very important in your um, frame of reference. A lot of public companies talk the talk but are not able to walk the walk regarding innovation, specifically when it comes to not incremental stuff, but disruptive stuff. They have the capital, they sometimes even have the personnel, but they're not able to deliver while as maybe a smaller entrepreneurial company does. Now you worked with all kinds. You've been able to make some of the biggest companies get bigger and you, and you now work with smaller companies and now are taking them big too. So tell us or our audience, what differentiates or what is that X factor that enables a company to deliver on its promise? Well, you know, there's, there's a lot of personality that goes into that question, both for the chairman, CEO, and the board of directors. From my experience, you know, the guy at the top sets the tone. And if the tone isn't set appropriately as to the expectations, to the vision for the future, the mission for the, for the company, the, the evidence of capital allocation, resource, you know, allocation, resource attraction, it falls apart internally. And, and you've seen it time and time again, where some of these massive conglomerates over the course of a dozen years or more disappear. They just disappear. And, and a lot of times the chairman CEO will get the blame, but there's usually a dozen board of directors who have sat around on their hands and allowed that to happen. The board has to take decis decisive action. They, they have culpability in making sure that a corporation uh, not only survives, but thrives going forward because so many people depend upon it. If you think about the auto industry, for every one auto worker, uh, this is dating a little bit, but there were 10 employees supporting that auto worker in tier one, two, and three. So when you had 145,000 UAW members potentially going on strike, you had 1.5 million people, families that could be affected by that strike, right? So so that's that's the way you have to think about the weight of the responsibility you have when you're in those positions. Uh, there, there's, a, there's a lot of privilege that comes with them. There's a lot of publicity that comes with them, but nothing is more important than making sure that business is successful for, for the hundreds and thousands of people, either investors, workers, suppliers, et cetera. So you have to feel the weight of that, of that responsibility every minute of every day. Um, shifting gears a little bit, Let's talk about boards. You've been on boards, you've worked with boards. Um, what's your opinion of a good board and what their job is, especially in view of the open AI um, yeah. you know, news that's come in recently? Yeah, well, it's interesting. Uh, when at General Electric, Jack's philosophy was, you know, if you wanna work, you're gonna work for GE. And we were not allowed to participate in any boards, uh, external boards. When I went to uh, Home Depot, I felt that that was a little bit of a deficiency. So I strongly encouraged my leadership team to participate on a board. I just thought, you know, it was interesting to sit on a board 
and start firing questions at a CEO or the CFO. And then when they were in our boardroom and our board was firing questions at them, they had a different perspective about that, right? Mm -hmm. In other words, they weren't offended by those because they were asking the same darn questions when they were a board of director member. So I, I just thought there was a learning experience in a sense of being on that side of the table and the value it bring to, to our board. So we kind of understood where the directors were coming from, point number one. Point number two, it was critically important that when I walked in as the chairman of the board, I literally had to turn my hat around and be open and critical myself of the CEO or be willing to take advice and counsel from the, uh, the board of directors. And, and we had a fantastic board uh, at GE. We had a fantastic board at, at, at Home Depot. We had some great members on the board that were extremely successful in their own right and valuable. And, and so the things that, that we would spend an inordinate amount of time getting ready for the board meeting, you can imagine we had 10 a year. And so I would take meticulous notes of questions or requests. And the minute the board meeting was over, I would consolidate those, send it out to the leadership team, and say, you know, you really only have 30 days to get ready to be able to respond to these things. So I really tried to make sure the board knew we listened, we learned, and then we tried to provide leadership, right? Listen, learn, and lead. And and what was, you know, a, a good board member back then didn't come into the room, open the FedEx box, and pull the material out. Nothing was more discouraging to a team that spent countless hours doing it. So I think a board has a responsibility to be an active participant. And and I attended a board meeting last night and I know we have all this technology, but I make a paper copy, sorry. I highlight everything that's in there and annotate where I wanna ask a question or, or, or an understanding. And so I, I just think board members uh, need to be actively involved. The National Association of Corporate Directors are doing a good job of making sure that directors understand the roles, responsibilities, and the accountabilities to be on a board in today's environment. You were able to sell your vision in very different environments, and you're still doing it, to boards, to your leadership team, to people below you. What was the one thing that you want our audience to learn that will enable them to do the same? You have to, first of all, you have to convey with conviction, the strategy. You have to convey with conviction why it's important to enhance the core, expand the, extend the business, and expand the market. And if, if the 350,000 associates weren't working in one of those verticals, they were being disadvantaged when it came time to evaluation. And then you had to make it direct. Uh, you had to make it reduce the complexity of the message so that everybody understood what you were saying, right? You had to make sure that they understood their role and how they would achieve that success individually and collectively. And, 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 and again, you, you, know, you just have to have energy in the conveyance of where you're going. You had to have tremendous enthusiasm about winning in a very competitive marketplace. You had to talk about you know, the importance of what it means to you individually and your families the more successful we are, the faster we'll grow, the better is your compensation, the better is your chance for leadership positions. So, you know, we, we would add, we had, I don't know, 150,000 net new jobs a year. So we were, we were really burning and churning in the marketplace, bringing people into to the family and creating a community within each of those businesses that had its own culture that you could participate in, that you felt an ownership for. Those were, those were all the things that I feel very strongly about. It's fascinating. And there is no doubt in my mind that we could sit here and talk for another two hours. But unfortunately, our time's limited. Just as a parting thought, what would be your message or advice to the upcoming uh, CEO and entrepreneur who's trying to change the, you know, the, the, the future with their new ideas? Yeah. Well, it's interesting you ask, you know, I've been very fortunate for the last 10 to 12 years to go to EY's Entrepreneur of the Year program. And there you've got 2,000 plus entrepreneurs. And every time I go out there, you know, I basically will schedule seven, eight, nine meetings back to back 
every 25 minutes and then and then have the privilege of talking to another entrepreneur and, and each one of course is different you know and, and the advice I would give some of them is you know do you really are do you really have a, a product differentiation are you really thinking about the funding to be able to to move this thing along are you really bringing in the right teams all the things that we've talked about right so so my suggestion uh, to your question is is for the CEOs today, again, this will be redundant, but you, you have to be that dry sponge in a bucket of water and you've got to absorb everything you can about your business in that industry so that you can make efficient, effective, and, and, and create a culture of, of, of success, of winning is, is the only game in town and in an appropriate way, of course, no fraudulent, no winking or blinking, but you want to create that competitiveness within your organization. You want to stay actively involved. You want to be approachable. You want people to be able to, you know, feel tremendous pride in following your leadership. You want to convey a level of confidence and they can trust you in the direction that you're going because their livelihood depends on it. You know, they, they, they figure, well, you'll get another job. I may not be able to get another job. Mm -hmm. So, so I have to have the confidence for myself and my family that we're moving in the right direction and I've got some continuity of service going forward. And, and then the marketplace has to recognize you as an innovator and a deliverer on, on, on your projections and your forecasts. So it's a, in today's environment, it's a full-time 24 seven job in my opinion, to really do it efficiently and effectively and, and to be able to convey all of that knowledge and confidence th throughout the entire organization. That's what I would tell you. And, and, and there's nothing more fun. There's nothing more exciting to me than business and, and operating businesses and winning in business today. You'll love it. You'll love it. Bob, this has been a fascinating conversation. There's so much for us, everyone to learn. I certainly did. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much for the opportunity and, and wishing you and EY and Nottingham Spurk the very best. Thank you. The Decoding Innovation podcast series is a limited production of the EY Nottingham Spurk Innovation Hub based in Cleveland, Ohio. For more information, visit our website at ey.com slash decoding innovation. If you enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe, leave a review wherever you get your podcasts, and be sure to spread the word.